Hatshepsut. The sheep of Amun Hatshepsut, she is an ancient Egyptian ruling queen, and she is the fifth in the sequence of kings of the 18th dynasty. She ruled after the death of her husband, King Thutmose II, as a guardian of the young King Thutmose III at first, then as the queen and daughter of the god Amun, after she published a story that she inscribed in her temple in Deir el-Bahari, in which she says it was the result of an intimate meeting between Amun and her mother, Queen Amos, and Maindo confuses her arrangement and places her after Amenhotep I in the middle of the 18th dynasty. Amun Hatshepsut, famously known as Hatshepsut, was the most famous and influential of the queens who ruled Egypt. Its rule was a significant point not only in the history of the 18th dynasty, but also in the entire history of ancient Egypt. Hatshepsut is the fifth king of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, and Egyptologists consider her one of the most successful kings of the ancient Egyptians. Her name means, consort of Amun, the favorite of the ladies, or consort of Amun, Dora, of the princesses. Birth and her family Hatshepsut was born in 1508 BC, the eldest daughter of King Thutmose I and Queen Amos. King Amos I, the owner of the great victory in liberating Egypt from the Hyksos, is considered the great-grandfather of Hatshepsut and the founder of the 18th Pharaonic dynasty to which she belongs. And, Hatshepsut, was the legitimate heir to the throne of the country, as there was no legitimate male heir, but she had a half-brother from her father, Thutmose II, from a secondary wife named Mutnofret. Teach her. Hatshepsut received an education on ethics and correct behavior, in addition to reading and writing, arithmetic and philosophy, religious rituals, grammar and composition. And she had to persevere in transmitting and learning the wisdom of the ancient Egyptian sages, like any of her colleagues, such as her half-brother, Thutmose II, young princes and princesses, and a number of sons of ministers and noble families, there is no doubt that she was afraid of the teacher who was teaching her lessons, and feared his violent methods with his students, regardless of their status. Hatshepsut could not claim any special privileges in her treatment, and the royal school in the house of Pharaoh, like other schools in the country, began early in the morning and ended at noon, as many schools in Egypt do at the present time. Her marriage Hatshepsut married her half-brother, Thutmose II, according to the custom of the pharaohs, who had no choice but to marry Hatshepsut, and she bore him a son and two daughters. As for the son, he died in his childhood, and his name did not remain on any trace of the monuments as for the two daughters, their names are, Neferuare, and, Meridare Hatshepsut. Her husband, Thutmose II, gave birth to his son, Thutmose III, from one of the concubines of the royal court, who was called, Iza. Taking Power The road was not smooth before Hatshepsut, and was furnished with roses in order for her to reach power. She faced with determination and stubbornness a society and a masculine religious authority, which refused to see the ruler except in the form of a man. Hatshepsut began a difficult time in her life when she was twenty years old, upon the death of her father, Thutmose I. She was previously a co-ruler with her father, and the legitimate heir to the throne. So it was reasonable to be the pharaoh who follows Thutmose I on the throne. However, the traditions of the court and the intrigues of the priests began to interfere in matters because the idea of ruling a woman and placing all powers in her hands was something they did not like. For this reason, it was imperative that her half-brother, Thutmose II, share with her in power, that person who is skinny and weak in health, who has little experience in managing the affairs of the country, and that he be a partner with her in the king as a pharaoh of the country, while she becomes a royal wife, nothing more than that. There was no benefit to be expected from the protest, as all the circumstances were against her, and they began to prepare for her marriage to Thutmose II. Thus, Thutmose II obtained the legitimacy of power, and we know little about his short-term reign, except for a revolution that took place in the south. But, instead of leading the army himself and marching to the enemies as his father used to do, 
he gave his teachings to his soldiers to be cruel to the furthest degree from those who are out of his rule. Thutmose II was a weak person and may have been sick at the same time, and in fact Hatshepsut was the one who managed the affairs of the state and ruled the country in his name from behind a curtain, and she was the one who commanded and forbade, and after a short time it became clear that he was walking on the path of death, and the courtiers and senior officials took they wonder what will happen when he dies? No other prince could succeed him on the throne, as if at last she would rule the country alone, while her friends, who knew her might and strength, were delighted at the idea, and were more than willing to serve her faithfully when the time came. However, her husband, Thutmose II, wanted to give his son, Thutmose III, the right to assume the throne after him, and there was a person plotting with the temple of Amun in Karnak provoking the general feeling among priests and people against the idea of a woman ruling them, and this person was he, Thutmose III, himself, who was living in the temple as one of his priests. Thutmose II died in 1501 BC, and one day shortly after his death, and when Hatshepsut was in the temple to witness a celebration in which the procession of the god Amun came out, the palanquin that was carrying the statue of Amun stood in front of a young priest and refused to budge after that. And all those present agreed that what happened was only a sign that Amun had chosen him to share the rule with her. And this priest, in front of whom the palanquin Amun stood, was Thutmose III, the son of her deceased husband. On the third day of May 1501 BC, Thutmose left his work as one of the junior priests in the Temple of Amun, to enter the royal palace of the pharaohs. She was surrounded by supporters and formed a party that supported her, and this party only took a short time until its influence intensified, and it became so strong that the pharaoh, who did not have sufficient experience, became completely incapable of ruling the country, and was forced to vacate the place for Hatshepsut. Finally, in 1478 BC, Hatshepsut was proclaimed king of Upper Egypt and the Delta, and she ruled Egypt and its possessions abroad alone as a pharaoh. And in songs of praise that were sung in her praise, they used to call her, the female Horus, and they added the feminine sign at the end of the word that indicates, the majesty. The royal cons in which Hatshepsut's name was written, and which appear on the walls of Deir el-Bahari, Karnak and other places in Egypt, were explicit in their meanings. Goddess of Radiance, Conqueror of all lands, who revives hearts, the mighty lady. This moment was the moment of victory for her, and the ancient Egyptian historian, Menehan, estimated her reign at twenty-one years and nine months. A question may arise here about what Hatshepsut did to Thutmose III, after she overthrew him and some might think that she killed him or exiled him to a place far from Egypt. However, the truth is that she entrusted the military education of this pharaoh, who was a young priest before that, and taught him the arts of state administration, to lead some military campaigns against the revolutionaries against Egyptian rule outside the country at the end of her rule, and he assumed power after her death, after his marriage to her daughter, Meridare Hatshepsut, which gave him legitimacy to rule, and he was one of the most powerful warrior pharaohs who ruled Egypt, and he was the first and most powerful Egyptian empire in history. Business during her reign The period of Hatshepsut's rule was characterized by peace and prosperity, and her reign was marked by the strength of the army, construction activity, and the great sea voyages that she sent to trade with neighboring countries. Sinai Island as work in those mines had stopped during the period of the Hyksos rule of Egypt and what followed, and we still find in Sinai a plaque with writing documenting this work, and glorifying what it did. Hatshepsut also activated the trade movement with Egypt's neighbors, where trade was in a bad state, especially during the reign of King Thutmose II. She reused a canal linking the Nile at the end of the delta with the Red Sea where she cleaned this canal after the Egyptians dug it during the Middle Kingdom, in order to run the Egyptian fleet. Bari with it to go out to the Gulf of Suez, and then to the waters of the Red Sea. And she ordered the construction of several facilities in the Karnak Temple, and she also established her temple in Deir el-Bahari in Luxor. 
Hatshepsut took care of the Egyptian merchant fleet, so she built large ships and exploited them in internal transportation to transport the obelisks that she ordered to be added to the Karnak temple to glorify the god Amun, and in trade exchange missions with her neighbors, and her reign was characterized by prosperity in Egypt, and the demand for recreational materials brought by commercial fleets from neighboring countries increased. Among the most important are incense, perfumes, spices, tropical plants and trees, predatory animals, and leather. Atlantic Expedition, Queen Hatshepsut sent a large fleet to the Atlantic Ocean, and trade with the Atlantic Ocean flourished to import some rare fish. Puntland Mission, Queen Hatshepsut sent a trade mission aboard large ships navigating the Red Sea loaded with Egyptian gifts and goods such as papyrus and linen to Puntland, present-day Somalia and southern Yemen, so the King of Punt received the mission well then returned loaded with large quantities of predators, woods, incense, ebony, ivory, leather, and precious stones. And Queen Hatshepsut depicted the news of that mission on the walls of the Deir el-Bahari temple on the west bank of the Nile at Luxor, and the colors that decorate the drawings of this temple are still bright and retain their splendor and beauty to a large extent. Aswan Expedition, also depicted on the walls of the Deir el-Bahari temple. Description of Hatshepsut's mission to granite quarries at Aswan to bring in the huge stones for the facilities, and it built two great obelisks of granite in Aswan to glorify the god Amun, each of about 35 tons, then they were transported on the Nile to Thebes, and the two obelisks took their place in the Karnak Temple in Luxor, and when Napoleon visited during the French campaign against Egypt in the year 1879, he ordered the transfer of one of the two obelisks to France and it still adorns. The Place de la Concorde in the French capital, Paris. Historians and engineers admire to this day the ability of the Egyptians to transfer these two obelisks from Aswan to Luxor. Moving them on the ground to the place of their construction is not easy at all, and what is more than that also is the construction of the two obelisks in the place chosen for them exactly in front of the edifice that Queen Hatshepsut built in the Karnak Temple a distance away. A few meters from the edifice, and engineers are still developing theories for the method that the ancient Egyptian engineer followed to do this mighty work. Not only that, Hatshepsut issued orders to build an obelisk that is considered the largest obelisk in human history, consisting of a single piece of stone weighing more than 1,000 tons, to place it. In the Karnak Temple, but the ancient Egyptian engineers left it after they discovered a crack in it that prevented its use. Tourists from all over the world are currently visiting to see the marvel of this unfinished obelisk in the Aswan Quarry, and they ask themselves, how did the ancient Egyptians want to transfer this giant obelisk to the Karnak Temple? A German Egyptologist describes the methods of cutting stone that the ancient Egyptians used to deal with the stone as if it were butter and indeed this can be seen in the Aswan Quarry, and it is now called, the Incomplete Obelisk. Military Campaigns Atlantic Expedition, Queen Hatshepsut sent a large fleet to the Atlantic Ocean, and trade with the Atlantic Ocean flourished to import some rare fish. Puntland Mission, Queen Hatshepsut sent a trade mission aboard large ships navigating the Red Sea loaded with Egyptian gifts and goods such as papyrus and linen to Puntland, present-day Somalia and southern Yemen, so the King of Punt received the mission well, then returned loaded with large quantities of predators, woods, incense, ebony, ivory, leather, and precious stones. And Queen Hatshepsut depicted the news of that mission on the walls of the Deir el-Bahari temple on the west bank of the Nile at Luxor, and the colors that decorate the drawings of this temple are still bright and retain their splendor and beauty to a large extent. Aswan Expedition, also depicted on the walls of the Deir el-Bahari temple. Description of Hatshepsut's mission to granite quarries at Aswan to bring in the huge stones for the facilities and it built two great obelisks of granite in Aswan to glorify the god Amun, each of about 35 tons, then they were transported on the Nile to Thebes, and the two obelisks took their place in the Karnak Temple in Luxor, 
and when Napoleon visited during the French campaign against Egypt in the year 1879, he ordered the transfer of one of the two obelisks to France, and it still adorns. The Place de la Concorde in the French capital, Paris. Historians and engineers admire to this day the ability of the Egyptians to transfer these two obelisks from Aswan to Luxor. Moving them on the ground to the place of their construction is not easy at all, and what is more than that also is the construction of the two obelisks in the place chosen for them exactly in front of the edifice that Queen Hatshepsut built in the Karnak Temple, a distance away. A few meters from the edifice, and engineers are still developing theories for the method that the ancient Egyptian engineer followed to do this mighty work. Not only that, Hatshepsut issued orders to build an obelisk that is considered the largest obelisk in human history, consisting of a single piece of stone weighing more than 1,000 tons, to place it. In the Karnak Temple, but the ancient Egyptian engineers left it after they discovered a crack in it that prevented its use. Tourists from all over the world are currently visiting to see the marvel of this unfinished obelisk in the Aswan Quarry, and they ask themselves, how did the ancient Egyptians want to transfer this giant obelisk to the Karnak Temple? A German Egyptologist describes the methods of cutting stone that the ancient Egyptians used to deal with the stone as if it were butter, and indeed this can be seen in the Aswan Quarry, and it is now called, the incomplete obelisk. Military Campaigns it was prevailing in the era of Hatshepsut, is the peace and prosperity and flourishing of trade with neighboring countries, was not inclined to the policy of foreign invasion. However, some few military campaigns were recorded during her reign, most of which came as disciplinary campaigns, in addition to one military campaign recorded during the reign of Hatshepsut by Thutmose III, which is the seizure of Gaza, and that was near the end of her rule. Some manuscripts, such as one found in the Senenmut tomb, TT-71, reveal disciplinary campaigns in Nubia and some other countries that were under Egyptian authority, as follows. A disciplinary campaign against Nubia at the beginning of its rule, carried out by Hatshepsut. This was mentioned in the manuscript of the Chief of the Treasury, Tij. A punitive campaign against Syria and Palestine, according to a manuscript in Deir el-Bari plus a campaign against a rebellion in Nubia. Campaign against a rebellion in Nubia in the year 20 of its rule, written on the Tombos board. A punitive campaign against Mao near Furka division between the 20th and 22nd years of her reign. The secret of the appearance of Hatshepsut in the clothes of the male pharaohs. Hatshepsut did not want to invent a new appearance in the appearance of the ruling pharaoh, which people had been accustomed to for decades. Although at the beginning of her reign she was portrayed as a fully groomed woman, later on she became an example of a strong, muscular pharaoh who wears a false beard. She began to wear clothes similar to the clothes of the male pharaohs who preceded her in official ceremonies, and she also appeared in some of her statues with a borrowed chin, as is customary in the statues of the pharaohs. Although this did not diminish the fact that Hatshepsut possessed all the characteristics of a beautiful female, she had a pleasant russet complexion, a slightly hooked nose, and a round face. And she loved flowers, gardens, trees, and everything fragrant and colorful. Was there a love story between the queen and the engineer, Senmet? Senmet was an exciting mystery in the life of Hatshepsut, the engineer who built her famous temple in Deir el-Bahari, to whom she awarded 80 titles, and who was responsible for raising and educating her daughter the young princess, Nefruare, and he reached out of his love for his queen to dig a tunnel between her tomb and his grave, to be close to it in the next life, as he was close to it in this world. As for her, she appreciated his brilliance and the strength of his personality, to the extent that she allowed him to build his tomb in the precincts of her temple, so that he would be next to her in his death, as he used to do in this world. And if the hints of historians came to indicate that there was a state of love that brought the two together, then we would die and Hatshepsut, after the death of her husband. But, this is not a sure thing, and it may just be a relationship of mutual respect. And the royal engineer, Senmet, is the one who built Hatshepsut, 
the most beautiful funerary temple built for a queen in history, whether ancient or modern, which is the temple of Deir el-Bahari, which he built in the bosom of the western mountain, and its construction came with royal white limestone brought from Torah, and in the form of three halls above one another, in order to the queen's spirit ascends her to the sky to be immortalized with the stars. Her death. Hatshepsut died on the tenth of the second month of the fall semester, which corresponds to January 14, 1457 BC, during the twenty-second year of her reign, as stated in writing on a tablet found in Armont. It has been ascertained from the mummy of Hatshepsut that the signs of her death are signs of a natural death, and that the cause of her death is due to her suffering from cancer or diabetes. Hatshepsut's tomb is located in the Valley of the Kings and is symbolized by the number KV20. Hatshepsut may have expanded her father's tomb in order to use it, and her coffin was found next to her father's. Recently, I took a picture of the mummy of Queen Hatshepsut, in which she appears with a dreamy and meek smile. As if he had fulfilled his mission perfectly and finally rested. The funny thing about the picture is that the queen had soft, beautiful colored hair. It appears clearly in the picture as well, and this indicates that the science of mummification, which the ancient Egyptians created, was a great secret if it was discovered. It may change the aspects of burial in the entire world. Whatever the matter of Queen Hatshepsut, she is one of the few women in the ancient world who reached the top of administration in their country. Or not convince them, what you did was far greater than what some kings of men have done. Hatshepsut, meaning, one of the most prominent noble ladies. 1508-1458 BC, was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty in ancient Egypt. Egyptologists consider her one of the most successful pharaohs, holding the title longer than any other woman in the Egyptian dynasty. Her reign was marked by the strength of the army, construction activity, and the great sea voyages she sent to trade with neighboring countries. She is the eldest daughter of the Egyptian pharaoh, King Thutmose I, and her mother, Queen Amos. Her father, the king, had fathered an illegitimate son, Thutmose II. She accepted to marry him according to the custom of royal families, so that they would share power together after his death, and that was a solution to the problem of having a legitimate heir to him. Her family. This queen left many mysteries and secrets, and perhaps the most exciting of these mysteries is the character of Senmet, the engineer who built her famous temple in Deir el-Bahari, to whom she granted eighty titles. He was responsible for the care of her only daughter, and his love for his queen reached such a degree that he dug a tunnel between her tomb and his own. And if the historians hinted at the existence of a love affair that brought the two together, Senmet and Hatshepsut, then the queen and her servant also participated in a legendary life, and each of them ended in a mysterious end that remains a mystery until now. Hatshepsut was the wife of King Thutmose II, about 1512 BC-1504 BC, of the 18th dynasty, and it seems that her husband was overthrown for a few years but they returned to the throne in 1493 BC, and for the next twelve years she devoted all her powers and resources Egypt to build roads, construct houses, and temples, and to improve the internal conditions of the country, and try to keep Egypt away from war with its neighbors. Her rule Hatshepsut's rule was famous for its peace and prosperity, as it was trying its utmost to develop relations, especially trade, with the countries of the ancient East, to prevent any wars with them. Taking Power Jaser Jesseru is the main building in the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut's complex at Deir el-Bahari. It was designed by Senmet, as an example of perfect symmetry that predates the Parthenon by a thousand years. Hatshepsut faced many problems at the beginning of her rule, because of her rule, from behind the scenes without an official form, and some people say that she killed her husband and her brother, King Thutmose II, to seize power, but there is not enough evidence. On the other hand, she faced problems with the people, as most people believed that she was a woman and could not rule the country, as the king was, according to custom, a representative of the god Horus, the ruler on earth. 
Therefore, she was always dressed and adorned with men's clothes, and she was rumored to be the daughter of Amun to convince the people that she could rule. At the same time, the legitimate crown prince, Thutmose III, was still a boy and unable to take care of the country's interests. Hatshepsut worked to rule the country until he grew up, and she took into account that Thutmose III was given a military education so that he could take the reins of government later. Hatshepsut activated the trade movement with the neighbors of Egypt, where trade was in a bad state, especially during the reign of King Thutmose II, and she ordered the construction of several facilities in the Karnak Temple. She also established her temple in Deir el-Bahari in Luxor, and her reign was characterized by peace and prosperity. Hatshepsut in Popular Culture one of the most famous queens who took over the rule of Egypt and is considered one of the beauties. Hatshepsut was the first to wear gloves, due to the presence of a congenital defect in her fingers, six fingers or more in one hand. She was ordering the sculptors to do so, and she was also the first to embroider gloves with precious stones. <laughs> In the end, I thank Jason for your follow-up. We hope to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button, and do not forget to like. We also await your support through the Super Chat and the Thank You feature.